Good evening and welcome to our City Council meeting for November 16th. And I would like to call to the podium Tech Sergeant Charles Mortensen and Private First Class uh, Alden Knut to lead us off in the Pledge of Allegiance right there. Thank you. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so very much. And the two gentlemen who led us off in the Pledge of Allegiance are World War II heroes, and we will learn more about them in just a minute. The Greatest Generation. First, the roll call, please. Councilmember Adam. Here. Councilmember Jones. Here. Councilmember McNamee. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Engler. Here. And Mayor Bill De La Pena. Present. We do have a request for a continuance, and that is we will be moving item 11A, the Investment Review Commission Annual Report, and that will be moved up to be heard right after the consent calendar. All right. And now, we will continue with not only a special presentation, but really a privilege and an honor. We will honor two Legion of Honor honorees. We will begin with Technical Sergeant Charles Mortensen of the U.S. Army, who received the Legion of Honor Medal in 20, um, actually this year, and, and uh, also the um, Private First Class, Eldon Knut, who received it in 2019. Mr. Mortensen entered active duty in May of 1943 and served through April 1946. He was assigned to the 22nd Infantry Regiment of the 42nd Infantry Division as an ammunition squad leader. That was just one year after graduating from Van Nuys High School. Can you imagine being called to fight the Nazis one year after graduating from high school? His significant decorations include the EAME Campaign Medal with two battle stars, the Combat Infantryman Badge, and the Good Conduct Medal. After returning from service, Charles worked with the LA Unified School District as a regional director taught at the college level until, until his retirement in 2007. Charles and his wife of 79 years, I mean 75 years, imagine 75 years, reside in Thousand Oaks. And we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your service. Now, our second Legion of Honor honoree is Private First Class Eldon Knut, who served in the U.S. Army through World War II. Mr. Knut was ordered to report to the 95th Infantry Division, where he worked to liberate the heavily fortified city of Metz in France. He suffered from trench foot, and after nine months of hospitalization, he was discharged with 50% disability. Following Mr. Knut's discharge from the Army, he pursued higher education and went on to obtain his PhD in aeronautics from Caltech in 1953. He was appointed a knight in the French Legion of Honor in 2019. Mr. Knut and his wife Margaret reside also in Thousand Oaks. And again, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your service, Mr. Knut. 
And we were not able to be with you last year when you were awarded the highest medal that France has to offer, both in military or civilian life. And so we decided that while we are then also honoring your friend and neighbor, we would honor you as well. I had the privilege of being present at the presentation last Thursday, and I would like to show you a brief video. Tech Sergeant Charles R. Mortensen, the U.S. Army, was born in Los Angeles, California in October 1924. During World War II, he served as an ammunition squad leader with the 222nd Infantry Regiment of the 42nd Infantry Division. His significant decorations include the EMA Campaign Medal with two battle stars, the Combat Infantry Badge, and the Good Conduct Medal. Charles and his wife, Martha, reside in Thousand Oaks, California. The uh, French Consul General, Julie Duot uh, Bedos, awarded this medal to you, to both of you, with the following words. France has not forgotten these American young men, like you, who demonstrated their selflessness, generosity, and unwavering bravery and courage. Whilst under fire by the enemy, France has not forgotten and will forever remember the soldiers who have lost their lives during those terrible battles. She also said that in the name of the French Republic, I would like to assure you that we have not forgotten your personal commitment 77 years ago, and we have remained grateful. We owe you our freedom. I will now present to you Do I know how to do that? All right. Mr. Mortensen, yes. just like the French ambassador, um, not ambassador, but the um, French consul said, you know, in the name of the president, I'm going to say, au nom de la ville Thousand Oaks, <laughs> moi, la mère de la ville de Thousand Oaks, je vous uh, remets le certificat de la reconnaissance. So I'm going to present to you the certificate of recognition on behalf of the city of Thousand Oaks. Congratulations. Merci. This microphone is on, and for you as well. So on behalf of the city of Thousand Oaks, I would like to present the certificate of recognition to you for your bravery in World War II, fighting on French soil against the Nazis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you can, and now you can say a few words. We go with you first. OK. The microphone is on. Well, Madam Mayor, thank you very, very much for this opportunity, and uh, I thank you for the uh, recognition given in Thousand Oaks, and as I said to the mayor, because of this, you have all earned my vote, because we do live here in Thousand Oaks. We're happy to do that. 
I, I want to say just a very few words about our experience in France. Uh, I landed there in France and Marseille in December of 44. Extremely cold. And uh, Eldon will say he was up in the northern part of the France and very, very cold. I had an extremely cold winter. And being in the infantry, we dug a lot of holes and we got down close to the dirt. And uh, it ended up that I was in a squad of ammunition uh, carriers. And we went through the rest of the war uh, really riding in the two, two and a half ton trucks uh, full of ammunition. And we went through from Strasbourg to Würzburg to Schweinfurt to Firth and Munich. And we were headed to Salzburg when the war ended. And then I discovered with that background of France that we were able, the French had gotten reorganized, they were free of Germany, and they, we could have passes to Paris, a three-day pass to Paris. Well, that's how I ended my career, a three-day pass to Paris. It was wonderful. We got to ride the subway without, as long as we were in uniform, we could ride the subway. And of course, I think we must have gone to the Folie Bergere, uh, and we can say, ooh la la, for France. So a, a, a interesting time of three years in my life and a good part of it spent in France and Germany. But I thank you all very, very much. We landed in France in the fall of 1944 and were assigned to Patton's Third Army. It was important to capture the city of Metz, which is the most heavily, heavily fortified city in France. I think it's the most heavily fortified city in Europe. The 5th Division had tried to capture Metz before by direct assaults on the various forts surrounding Metz. There were 12 forts surrounding Metz. But their loss of life was uh, unacceptable. So we were given an alternative task, surround the forts and starve them out. We surrounded the largest fort, Fort Joan de Arc, on the 14th of November, 1944. The weather was not very friendly. We, about 30 of us wound up behind the German lines with supplies provided only by small planes flying overhead. We didn't know it at the time but the general in Metz ceased uh, his defense several days later, and I, along with about 30 others, on the 19th of November, walked down to what used to be the barracks, German barracks. I, I, my feet were bothering me, so I went to the first aid. They looked at my feet, put me on an ambulance, and I spent nine months in the hospital first in England, then in the United States. 
because I got a, a uh, disability discharge, I got an even better uh, support for education than under the GI Bill. They paid for my education for four years rather than time of service plus one year. So I went to Purdue University for four years and did well enough that I was able to uh, continue my education four more years, one at Purdue and three at Caltech. I came out to Caltech in 1950. I forgot to go back to the Midwest. Uh, I was on the faculty at UCLA, 1956 to 1991. Years. About 19, about 2012, we looked around at retirement communities, and when we saw the one here in Thousand Oaks, we said, this is it. And we have not seen one that we, we would have liked better than the one here in Thousand Oaks. Thank you. Our city manager, Drew Powers, do we have someone to take a picture real quick with the council, perhaps, and the two? Thank you. Yeah, we will. Yeah, we can do that. Thank you so much. I uh, wanted to point out that our honorees this evening were wearing their uh, Légion d'honneur med medal um, on their chest. So, uh, you know, I get so emotional about these things because the greatest generation tells us what sacrifice is really like. 
and what it truly is. Thank you so much. I would have loved to have been in Paris when the Allies marched in in, in August of 44. That would have been really moving to see all those troops come in after four years of Nazi occupation of Paris. They were describing some of that um, at the ceremony last Thursday on Veterans Day. La Libération. Mm -hmm. And it was the French that gave us a Statue of Liberty. Let's remember that as well. So I know how to say come to dinner in French. Soupçon. Okay. <laughs> Not funny, huh? You know, uh, some pictures are still being taken, but um, it's hard to follow this ceremony with another special presentation. That's right. We owe them our freedom. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. He was actually at the engineering school when I was there at UCLA, and my father also taught in the computer science department, which was right with the electrical engineering department. What a small world it is. Yes, and of course, you know, I'm half German too, so it always carries special meaning for me. <laughs> All right, now, will I collect myself? I'd like to move on to the second portion of special presentations. And I am pleased to introduce this month's recipient of our Community Commitment Award, which is always um, one of my favorites. Her name is Rosalinda Vint. Ms. Vint serves as the president and CEO of the nonprofit organization, Women of Substance and Men of Honor in Thousand Oaks. As a child, Ms. Vint entered the foster care system and worked hard to make a strong path for herself. She worked in corporate America for many years before leaving her career and dedicating her life to serving youth in need. She has served and supported thousands of youth through housing, employment, education support, transitional services, and mentorship as they transition out of the foster care system. Ms. Vint is the embodiment of patience, empathy, and understanding, and has done a tremendous job supporting our young people in the city of Thousand Oaks. Congratulations, Rosalinda, for receiving the Community Commitment Award for the month of November. We are so very thankful to have leaders like you working hard to advance our community. And before I call you up to the podium, I'd like to present a video about you. Hi, I'm Claudia Bill de la Pena, Mayor of the City of Thousand Oaks, and we are here today with the November honoree of our wonderful Community Commitment Award, and she is the amazing Rosalinda Vint, Executive Director of the nonprofit organization Women of Substance, Men of Honor. Hi, Rosalinda. How Hi. are you? Good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm now, so excited. The Community Commitment Award is an award in which we highlight persons who have given so much behind the scenes and have not been recognized all that much, if at all. But your organization continued through the pandemic to, re to help foster youth, uh, persons who have um, aged out of foster care, for example. You are different from other organizations in that you offer wraparound services and help these kids and young adults get back on their feet. Tell us more about what you've done. Well, what we've done during the, um, the pandemic, which, you know, it's just been an honor to serve. We knew that we needed to rise, um, that our small task force needed to come together, our small organization, and not leave the most vulnerable population behind. And those are the kids that are in the SCRTP um, homes, which are formerly known as group homes, and those that have in extended foster care. And what has happened is that they, unlike many, didn't have parents that they could be locked down with. 
They didn't have family. Um, we became their family. The staff at their group homes were their family, or they were alone in their apartments. And so what we did was we gave that hand up. We made sure that they had um, clothing. We made sure that they had supplies. We made sure that they had rides to their mental health um, physicians. So it was an honor to be able to do that. And coming from foster care, I knew what it was like to just sit in a home hoping someone would come and not knowing how to reach out. The organization has been around since about 1998 and has grown quite a bit. You have moved from smaller quarters to a new facility that is so much bigger and can provide so much more to your clientele. Tell me what are some of the um, your success stories that you have had. Some of our success stories have been um, youth um, that we serve in our housing program, that they have lived there and they've been able to go on and get their own housing. Some of our other success stories are them coming out of the Division of Juvenile Justice, um, um, getting married, having a family, a working citizen, a working, able, law-abiding citizen. We have some that are firefighters, and we have some that are the unsung heroes. They are the ones that come here day in and day out. They'll donate for Halloween. They'll clean the facility. They will just... Um, be the ones behind the scenes that don't want to be seen. So Rosalinda mentioned one of the success stories and he is Carlos Barba and he is with us today. Carlos, you mentioned also to me that um, you had some struggles in life, uh, but you're here, a productive citizen of the community, productive citizen of the world. And you know, <laughs> we, you know, I'm looking at all these paintings that were completed and created by foster youth, and they depict the struggles that foster youth often encounter. You were one of them. How did you get out, and how did you get the upper hand? You know, I was basically on that path, on that way. Um, I ended up doing some time where I met Rosalinda in the Ventura Youth Correctional Facility. I took her course, uh, I graduated her course, and um, it really just opened my eyes, and she just, uh, she offered her services, her helping hand, and I, um, I, I found myself in a place where I decided help was gonna be necessary. So I reached out to her and um, I've been attending her programs and helping out the youth and helping out any which, I, any which way I can. I just wanna say thank you to a Women of Substance Matter of Honor and most of all, Rosalind Vince. It wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for her. So I nominated you, Rosalinda, because I know one, you're so deserving of this award. Um, your heart for not just the youth that you serve, but for the community is unmatched. And I just wanted to do this small gesture of all the great things that you've done. I just knew that you deserved to be nominated. Um, as you mentioned, you've helped so many youth, and not just with mentoring, but with housing and all of the Alpha Leadership support um, and the transitional services. I mean, you really put in your hard work seven days a week, 365 days of the year. I think maybe you take one day to yourself. Um, and I just wanted you to know how much the community loves you, how much you've done for the youth, and this is the least that I can do. So it's my honor to nominate you, and I'm just so grateful that we're able to do this today for you. So Rosalinda, we're honoring you with the Community Commitment Award for the month of November for your amazing service to our community and in particular the foster kids in our community. Thank so you. that you provide a tremendous service, an invaluable service, and for that you're being recognized. Congratulations. Wow. Here we go. And here's your award oh. for bringing for, and for Gloria. being the ray of light in our community. Congratulations. Thank you, Thank you. and bless you. Bless Thank you. you. Thank I you. I really appreciate this. This means a lot. Thank you so it much. Does. So if you would like to nominate someone for the Community Commitment Award, please nominate him, her, or them by going to the city's website, www.toaks.org forward slash CCA so that we can honor them and highlight them in our community. Thank you so much. And we have Rosalinda here with us this evening. So you already have your award and your certificates, mm -hmm. uh, but we wanted to, again, congratulate you and allow you to say a few words if you wish. Okay. Well, first and foremost, thank you, Madam Mayor, for the opportunity um, to receive the award and all of you here and your service to the community. 
Um, she mentioned that I am from the foster care system and many of the youth we serve are the, from there as well. And so you are our family. You are our Thousand Oaks family. Without you, we would not make it. We wouldn't do well. And so on behalf of the foster youth here in Thousand Oaks, those that you're serving that are in some of the STRTPs or the other families that are hosting them, I like to say, we um, wanna thank you. And more importantly, we want you to know that we love you, that we may not be um, easy to manage sometimes, but that we are hoping that you will give us that chance. And th the city of Thousand Oak has no, not only given us the chance through me, but also just by providing this opportunity for them to see one of their own, older own, make it. Um, I would also wanna say, on behalf of Women of Substance, Men of Honor, it's not just me, I'm just the face. But there's so many volunteers from our city, the city of Thousand Oaks, that rally around us, that come in at any time to help, that pray for us, that serve with us, that love on the kids, and that appreciate all that you are doing here for us. So we wanna say on behalf of Women of Substance, Men of Honor, we cannot help to save one youth at a time without you, Mayor, and without all of you here in the city of Thousand Oaks. May God bless you, may God keep you, may we continue to wrap our arms around the most vulnerable population that sometimes is left behind. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so very much, and we wish you all the best, hopefully, for another successful year where you can help other youth, foster youth, um, really, you know, get on their feet once they age out so that they're not left behind. Thank you. Appreciate that. And with that, we are concluding our special presentations. Um, I know I would like to go to public comments, and we'll call on the city clerk to announce public comments. This is a time and place for public comments for those wishing to address the city council regarding items on the agenda or on a subject within the city's jurisdiction. All remarks should be addressed to the council as a whole. Speakers are requested to state their name and community residence for the record. Under state law, public comment matters may not be considered by the council unless listed on the agenda but may be referred to the city manager for administrative follow-up. Five individuals have requested to speak, and pursuant to council standards, speakers are allowed three minutes. Thank you very much. The first speaker this evening is someone whom we know, someone whom we have gotten to know even closer, and his name is Michael Morissette. Good evening. There we are, good evening. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and esteemed council members. Um, my name is Michael Morset. I live in Simi Valley. Um, I am here tonight to represent the artist Ali Alinejad. Um, he's the artist who uh, created the sculptures that we see presently on a 30-day um, temporary exhibit in front of the Civic Arts Plaza. Um, Ali created this sculpture art to represent the, the names of the 12 who were lost at the borderline shooting. And, sorry, and um, I just wanted to come on his behalf and on behalf of the family members, the borderline family members, and thank you, um, City Council and the City of Thousand Oaks for allowing temporarily the art exhibit to to be displayed on city property. And um, it, it's, it's important at this time of year. Um, also, I guess it's a good time to thank you for the proclamation of uh, Remembrance Day on November 7th in, in honor of, um, of that event as well. Um, I believe that's very meaningful to the city and uh, to those of us who don't live in the city uh, but are part of that community. Um, I, the, the reason that they're temporarily displayed um, is kind of twofold. Uh, one is because of the anniversary of November 7th um, in, the, in, in this month. And, and then the second reason is um, that as, as family members and then on behalf of the artist, um, sorry. 
on behalf of the artist, um, there is a desire to to seek a permanent location for the art in the community, and Thousand Oaks itself um, seems the only likely place for this to be. Um, so having it out there in the public eye um, exposed and, and having it um, um, as a subject of discussion, um, hoping that we uh, can create some debate on whether or not um, there is another, uh, or finding, I um, should, should say, finding the permanent home location for the art. So um, just wanted to remind you and the community that the art was not specifically created for the families, but it was created um, for the community. It was a gift in the community, and it is a vehicle for um, um, to represent healing and resilience in the community. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, Daniel, followed by Hillary White. And I believe all of the speakers tonight will be via Zoom. Okay, we don't have Daniel. How about Hillary White? Nope, Hillary, okay. How about Lauren Rogers? No? Do we have Lauren Rogers? No, okay. Do we have Catherine David? No, okay. Uh, do we have Kat Selm? Pardon me? Ah, okay, so Kat Selm submitted something um, in writing, but we'll speak later on consent calendar. Okay, very good. So, well, actually not very good. We didn't get to any of our speakers. Do we know why? Okay. All right. Um, then we will go to the consent calendar, and I will then now call the public speakers for the, or the speakers on the consent calendar. And the first one will be Kat Selm. Hi, good evening, Madam Mayor and Honorable Council Members. My name is Kat and I'm a resident of Thousand Oaks and a co-founder of the Conejo Climate Coalition. And I just wanna thank you tonight for approving the microgrid installs at the pump stations and the Civic Arts Plaza. Uh, we think that these types of installations help with the future adaptation at times when we have public safety power shutoffs and other times when the grid may be insecure. So we should be investing in battery backup storage at all major and critical facilities. And I'm very glad to see my city taking lead on this forward thinking approach. Thank you so much. I'll yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next one is Clint Foltz. Hello, my name is Clint Foltz. I'm a member of the Caneo Climate Coalition and I live in Thousand Oaks. I'd like to commend the city of Thousand Oaks for considering the implementation of battery energy storage systems and microgrid infrastructure. This is absolutely a move in the right direction. These microgrid systems will save money and unlike diesel backup generators, won't emit greenhouse gases or create noise pollution. A microgrid can also benefit neighbors when it's used to strengthen the broader electrical grid. Microgrids can augment normal grid operation by participating in demand response programs or providing ancillary services. Microgrids can also help ease strain on the central grid during periods of peak demand. They act as an additional resource that grid operators can call upon during high demand times. I urge the city to make these and additional microgrid systems available to the community during emergencies to aid in communication and allow community members to charge their cell phones. Microgrids could also be used to provide cooling centers during heat waves, which sometimes result in uh, power outages. So thank you for considering the implementation of these microgrids and working towards future-proofing our community. I think this can be a win-win for everybody in Thousand Oaks. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Faith Grant. I live in Westlake Village, and my comments are on the microgrid also. 
Um, I think it's a very positive and forward thinking decision that the city made in approving the expenditure for microgrids for some city facilities and doing so in conjunction with funding from SoCal Ed and SoCal Gas incentive programs assists in helping the city transition to renewable, reliable and clean energy. We have to be diligent about identifying ways to migrate away from fossil fuels in order to reverse global warming. Microgrids provide clean energy, reducing the environmental impact of power generation and our city's carbon footprint. And since our community used to experience wildfires and power shutoffs, we require critical infrastructure that increases reliability and resilience. A microgrid can continue serving our community when the grid is down. While reliability is about keeping the power on, resilience describes the ability to avoid power outages in the first place. An added bonus for our utility company is that microgrids improve the operation and stability of the regional electrical grid. Lastly, microgrids can lower energy costs for our city and ultimately its residents. And that's not just the cost of operations, but the subsequent expenses that may result when a facility is unable to function due to a power shutoff. So I hope that the city continues to explore these opportunities and that there will be many more microgrid installations. Thank you. Yes, I hope so too. Next will be Daniel. No, Daniel. Uh, again, Hillary White. And. Okay, and then Daniel, uh, is, that's for the Investment Review Committee, okay. So I guess this was all for the consent calendar. Any um, questions, motion? I'll move the consent calendar, Madam Mayor. Okay, we have a um, motion to approve. Let's take a vote. Council Member Adam? Yes. Council Member Jones? Aye. Council Member McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Yes. And Mayor Bill De La Pena. Yes. And that motion carries 5-0, and I do have an ordinance title to read into the record. An ordinance amending the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code, repealing in its entirety Title VI, Chapter 2, and adding, adding title, title VI, Chapter 2, adopting regulations for solid waste, organic waste and recyclable materials collection, processing and disposal, and making a determination of exemption under CEQA in connection therewith, ordinance number 1688NS. Thank you. We now go to item number 11, which will be the City Investment Review Committee annual report. And I believe that this will be presented by the uh, chair of the committee, John Short joining us via Zoom. Good evening, Madam Mayor, oh, City Council Jamie. members. Sorry, Hi. okay. Um, I just wanted to introduce uh, Chair Short of our Investment Review Committee. He'll be giving the presentation tonight on behalf of the committee members. And I just wanna take the opportunity to thank our committee members for their dedication and their service to the city and serving on the Investment Review Committee over the past year. Uh, staff really appreciates their insightful questions and our discussions that we have. And so again, just wanted to send our appreciation and thanks to all of the committee members for sure. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Short. Good evening, Madam Mayor, council members and staff. The Investment Review Committee was established in 1997 and is comprised of five members with experience in finance and investments. The members serve two-year terms with staggered expirations. Currently, members are myself, Jim Hoagland, Mark Kronke, and Cody Sorensen. A vacancy was created by Richard Law's resignation in July. His term, my term, and Mark Kronke's term expire in December. On October 26, City Council appointed two new members and reappointed myself to two-year terms. The terms for Davin Carey and Anthony Gonzalez start January 1st, 2022. City, city, or city Council established this committee to monitor the treasurer's, re, uh, treasurer's compliance with the investment policy and report to the City Council on quarterly and annual basis. The committee also recommends changes to the investment policy. 
The committee presented its last annual report to City Council on December 15th, 2020. The committee also met its schedule four times during this past year. The city's portfolio yield decreased by 45 basis points since our last report. The decrease in the yield reduces the annual interest income by almost $1 million. In 2020, the Fed rate decreased to near zero. With the portfolio's five-year time horizon and laddered maturities, the city's yield will generally follow the direction of the Fed fund rates, but the yield will move slower, both when rates are decreasing and when they are increasing. Recent forecasts suggest that the Fed rates will remain near zero through mid-2022 while the economy recovers from the pandemic and the supply chain issues. This outlook can change over time depending upon inflation, economic activity, as well as job growth. The committee's quarterly review shows a diversified pool of low-risk investments in compliance with the city's stated policy. The committee submitted a report of its findings to city council after each meeting. Agendas and summary notes were also provided to council members and are available on the city's website. The city's investment policy currently prohibits the purchase of commercial paper and medium term corporate notes issued as private placements. This restriction was due to the Security and Exchange Commission regulations rather than due to California law or an inherent credit risk of these investments. The SEC regulation has amended, has now been amended, allowing local agencies with portfolios of more than $100 million to purchase private placement investments. By removing the private placement restriction of the investment policy, the city will increase the pool of high quality investments available to purchase. Purchases will still meet all other investment policy and California law requirements, including minimum credit quality and maximum term. Staff will address the SEC amendment and the committee's recommendations recommended change to the investment policy when staff presents a policy to council in January. The recommendation this evening is to receive and file this report. Madam Mayor, council members, staff, and the entire city of Thousand Oaks, happy Thanksgiving and may your holiday season be filled with much joy and happiness. Thank you. Well, thank you very much and all the best to you and a wonderful holiday season to you as well. Now, let me see here. We have questions available for questions. Jane Edelman, if council has any questions. No questions? No comments? Okay. The recommendation is to receive and file the report then. So moved. Thank you. I'd like to thank John for all oh. of his service too. Yes. Um, and in fact, while there was one speaker, not sure if Daniel, no, okay. All right, well, thank you very much, John. Appreciate that and the, and the committee. And with that, And with that, we will go to our only public hearing this evening. And Madam Clerk, would you please open that hearing? Madam Mayor, if I could just do a roll call quick on this motion. That's on oh, the, the motion to receive and file was an actual motion, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Council Member Adam? Yes. Council Member Jones? Aye. Council Member McNamee? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Engler? Yes. And Mayor Bill Della Pena? Yes. And that motion carries 5 0. Thank you so much. All right, now we can open the public hearing. Hearing advertised as required by law is open to consider agenda item 8A, revised water conservation ordinance and water use reduction resolution. And at this time, Madam Mayor, we do not have any public speakers. Well, it is a very important item, however. And we will now go to Dr. Helen Cox, our Sustainability Division Manager. Good, e good evening. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, members of the Council. I'm here this evening to address the City's Revised Water Conservation Ordinance. Also with me this evening and available to answer your questions is our Senior Analyst, John Brooks. 
So why do we need to update our ordinance? Well, the city is required to prepare and file with the state an urban water management plan, which is a long-term water resources planning document. It's updated every five years. The urban water management plan includes a water shortage contingency plan as one of its components. This details the actions that the city will take during water shortages. Council adopted the current urban water management plan in June this year, and now we need to update our water conservation ordinance to be consistent with the adopted measures. The water shortage contingency plan changed this year as a result of new state requirements for a six level system. The existing um, system has three levels of water shortages, as shown here on the left, with defined actions at each level. The new one has six, as shown on the right, and requires the city to define the measures it will take to meet the conservation goals of each. We'll briefly review the measures at each savings level. In addition to the current three-level system, we have permanent water conservation measures that we can think of as a sort of level zero. These measures transition over to the new level one measures with a couple of minor changes. Instead of allowing irrigation seven days a week, this will shift to four days in summer and three in winter, and the hours of day at which watering is prohibited are extended an hour at the end of each day. These changes align us with our sister water agencies that operate in the city. At the next savings level, irrigation is reduced by one day to three in summer and two in winter with some exceptions as listed here. At the next level, irrigation opportunities are further reduced by a day, but with the same exceptions as listed um, previously. Some additional measures are introduced, such as the prohibitions on draining and refilling pools and the requirement to cover swimming pools to reduce evaporative losses. At a requirement for 30% or more savings, irrigation is limited to one day per week and the categorical exemptions are eliminated. Drip or other low, low volume irrigation systems or hand watering is required. Measures become increasingly severe as we move to savings requirements of 40% or more. At this level, residents are limited to hand watering only and commercial watering is limited to one day a week for trees and shrubs only. At this level, no turf watering is per permitted. Additionally, no meters would be available for new construction. At savings of 50% or more, only essential water needs can be met. No irrigation is permitted. Uh, let's hope we never get to this level. With regard to current conditions, as you're aware, there's a statewide call for a 15% water use reduction, which has been echoed by our local supplier, Cayegas Water District. Most recently, Metropolitan, which operates the state water project, made an emergency drought declaration. The Cayegas board convenes tomorrow to decide whether to take further action. Our recommendation tonight is to adopt the ordinance to include the new water shortage contingency plan levels and to adopt the resolution asking for a 15% water use reduction and declaring a water shortage under level one of the existing ordinance. Because the revised ordinance would not go into effect until the end of this calendar year, the shortage must, must be declared yeah, so under the existing ordinance which will automatically transition to level two of the new ordinance once that comes into effect. As a reminder, this will limit watering to two days a week since we are now in the winter season. Our next steps are to develop an outreach plan to residents and businesses and promote existing water savings rebates, such as those for turf removal and water saving appliances. These can be found at the website bewaterwise.com. We continue to coordinate with our supplier and sister agencies. Residents can report water waste through the city's online service request platform, ConnectTO, for any city follow-up. 
That concludes our presentation. Thank you. We're available to answer your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Cox. I mean, it is frightening to be looking at these pictures of Lake Oroville. I don't understand how we're supposed to be providing hundreds of thousands of homes and there is no water. I don't get that. Okay. Um, we do have a comment from the public uh, in the supplemental packet addressing this particular issue. Dr. Cox, I was wondering whether you had a chance to look at uh, this comment that mentions data management system allowing for data analytics of allocations and water use at a parcel level. Yes, in fact, um, so mm. a few things have, have changed since the um, sustainability plan was written though we have followed um, some of the recommendations in that plan. And what this refers to is um, doing allocations based on the parcel size or, and um, the land use of particular parcels. So since then, um, the state is actually in the midst of a water allocation study itself, which will conclude in the next couple of months. And as a result of that, the City Water Agency, along with all the other agencies in the state, will be given an, a water allocation budget by the state. So essentially, the agency as a whole will be allocated a certain allowance of water. Now, how that plays, what, what happens from there depends obviously on what that allocation is compared to our traditional historical water use. Mm -hmm. And we've been preparing for that. We do actually, we have actually joined that uh, California Data Collaborative, and we've been using that tool to map out water use at a parcel level and to compare that with um, what we expect to get as an allocation from the state. Um, our plans initially are to use that tool to do targeted outreach as necessary. So for example, um, if we're not meeting our targets through voluntary reduction, we would begin to do more targeted outreach to customers that um, exceeded median, median use by, you know, maybe a factor of two or something. So in other words, we would target our high users first with education and outreach first to make them aware of their water use compared to others and to try to help them and offer city support to um, enable them to identify whether they have leaks or to um, try to incentivize them and bring them aware of uh, rebate programs where they might reduce their water use. So that would be our initial approach is to use that data to have a more targeted um, outreach methodology. Oh, very good. Okay, um, Council Member McNamee, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. For apart apartment complexes, which some units are uh, individually monitored or they have uh, uh, meters attached to them, others it's for the entire apartment complex just as one meter. Are apartment complexes being asked to also do the conservation? And how do we help those that are under one meter for the entire complex versus individual apartments? How do we go about assisting those uh, folks in meeting their needs for conservation? So we have um, obviously data on service account level. So if the entire complex is on one service account, um, we would be asking that account to reduce its usage by, you know, 15%. Um, we would compare like properties, so compare the use of different multifamily um, units and obviously do outreach accordingly. So um, to some extent, the outreach within a multifamily complex would be the responsibility of that property manager, but obviously we would do our best to help the residents of that as well as the property manager in identifying where water savings might be available. It is a challenge when you have uh, one individual is responsible for that one meter, whereas when you've got 20 or 30 units under one meter, everyone's responsible and no one's responsible. So that's the challenge I'm sure we're gonna have to face at some point down the road. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank Mayor. you. Uh, Council Member Adam. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, hi, Dr. Cox. So right now, 
under the current system, we're in level one, correct? But come January, under the new system, we go to level two. So one will translate to two because we have, you know, three levels now, and we're going to have six levels. Right, so. okay. And level two means watering outdoors only three days a week, April through October, and only two days a week, November through March. Correct. Correct. And no watering from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Yes. I have to reset my sprinklers <laughs> right away. Um, yeah, and as I read the staff report, it was interesting to see that 70% of our water use comes from outdoors, irrigating lawns and gardens and swimming pools and the like. So this, this will take some education on our part for the public, but I know you have some plans for that. So. Yeah, I could take this off. I know you have some plans for that, so that'll be good. And as far as um, our uh, Canaille Valley uh, groundwater basin at uh, Las Robles Golf Course, that should bring us some relief, but not in the real near, near term, correct? I believe that's a longer term project. So yeah, we're not looking at that <clears throat> over the next you know, few years mm -hmm. or for a while. Yeah, yeah, I wish it was sooner, but... Uh, you know, from what I understand, we get maybe a 10% of our water usage will come from this groundwater that's built up over these many, many years. So sooner the better on that one, Cliff. All right, thank you very much. Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Jones. Yes, uh, 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 Dr. Cox, uh, what is our, our water outreach plan? Are we gonna make this information available to all our residents? Yes, um, so we're developing, you know, what the plan's gonna be in, in response to this current situation. And we'll be doing, um, as I mentioned, there's an opportunity to do some targeted outreach as we analyze water use on an individual level. But we'll also be promoting a lot of the rebates and opportunities that are provided um, by Metropolitan Water District, which, you know, we're, we're part of, such as the um, turf rebates, so generally speaking, we've been partnering with Cayegas Water District, and they've been doing a lot of the promotion in terms of uh, drought tolerant uh, landscaping, in terms of um, what's the existing turf rebate is about, they're supplementing that actually, it's about $3 a square foot right now if people replace their lawns with lower water use alternatives. So we will be promoting those along with our sister agencies and along with the Water District Cayegas. Well, well, that's my question. How are we promoting, promoting it? Are we sending out newsletters? Are we doing it? Uh, you know, I, I know that some people watch <laughs> our channel, but I don't know how many. Uh, they're, it's channel 10 on my uh, television. So, But uh, I'm wondering I if, if we're really going to get the word out to the public because this is very important, obviously. So Councilmember Jones, our communications manager, um, Alexander South is here. She's already been meeting with the team in Public Works. We'll have a full scale, as we do with all things like that's a full scale communications and marketing plan. It would be social media, video production, newsletters, electronic uh, um, uh, publications. Um, and um, we'll have decals on the side of vehicles. We have all sorts of different things uh, planned. So you won't really be able to turn anywhere without seeing messaging around, uh, around this. And there will be a hotline number. Uh, as there was the last time, those of you that are around will know when you see a situation that needs to be reported that uh, it's a hotline and we can call that and uh, attempt to achieve compliance uh, when we see those situations. Yeah, I was talking to our esteemed public works director, Mr. Finley, earlier and telling him that I have a neighbor that is letting a little bit too much water go on his lawn because I have a stream. <laughs> that is coming by the house uh, occasionally. And uh, I've always been resident, re reticent to, you know, go over to a neighbor and tell him to do something. So, but Cliff, you said there is a, I guess this is the same number that the city manager is talking about, that you can phone a number and someone will come out and convey the information. To yeah, the person. Them, and residents can report through the Connect TO application that's on our website and that's a mobile app. 
and um, they'll send the, the folks from the water operations team out and generally people get a door hanger as kind of a first warning just to alert them that it's been noticed and often we get um, very good results just from that first outreach. Yeah, one last thing. I see you say it's twice a, a week, but how, how many minutes each time? Does it vary with the property or is there a number of minutes that you use twice it's a day? Up to f up to 15 minutes unless you have the drip system and then it can be longer than that. Okay. Twice a day, 15 minutes. Twice a week. Twice a week, I mean. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Jones, if your neighbor is watching, he now knows. <laughs> well, I don't know how, you know, I, I don't know how popular this program is, but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> not very, probably, not very. Okay, um, if there are no other additional questions or Madam, comments. Madam Mayor. Oh, I'm sorry, Mayor Potem Engler, yes, you did want to say something. Thank you, I think. <laughs> sorry. Um, yes, Ms. Cox. Uh, uh, this, uh, I like the slide you had uh, in the presentation that uh, we, we've been on this road before. Um, I think it was 2000, was it 13, 14, or? Yeah, 14, 15. 14, 15. Um, at that time, I think we were required also to cut usage by, was it 15% as well? 28%, I believe. But I think, I think haven't we, we've retained about 15% of that 28, haven't we? Yeah, I think we're just about 20% below where we were prior to that previous drought. So we've retained a lot of the 28%. There's been a little bit of creep, but yes, we're still at about 20% below where we were previously. And, and so far, I think the, the governor called for a reduction back in, was it August? So far, how, how have we done as far as complying with that request to go to another 15%? So over the last four months, we're about 6% below where we were a year ago in 2020. He was looking for a 15% over last year. And if you total the last four months since he made that request, we're about 6% below where we were last year. Okay, so we have about another double, double to go to get to where the governor wants, but we're still better than we were a few years ago? Yes. Thank you. And Mayor? Who was that? Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> Who was that masked man? <laughs> uh, I, if, I, if I may, uh, just f for the benefit of the public, um, our city is 100% dependent on imported water from the Metropolitan Water District, which has been, been reliable, but you know, it's, it's nice to have a little water independence, and that's why uh, we're going back to our groundwater. You know, before we imported water, this city ran on wells, and we uh, watered cattle from those wells, and we served our population, but then we started importing in the wells. We're not used, but since then, the groundwater has accumulated and swelled up to the, almost to the surface, and so there's a particular well out at Los Robles Golf Course that we can tap into, that will give us about 500 acre feet of water per year. However, the water's not potable and it has to be desalted, I believe is the term. And so we're building a little desalter plant out there to do just that. So that'll give us a little water independence. It's said that we could get maybe 10% of our water needs. Less than 10. Party pooper. <laughs> Make it five. Anyway. Between five and ten, I don't know the exact number, but we'll take it, you know, because it's there to use, and uh, uh, I'm glad we're doing it. We, we, it's, we got a little timeline on it before we get it together, but uh, it, it's going to help. Mayor? Mr. McNamee. Just to uh, dovetail upon your observation there is that we're actually looking at, and the city is cooperating with Los Virgins Water System to take that water, send it over to Los Virgins for the reverse osmosis plant that they're uh, developing, as well as three, four, five months out of the year, send some of our wastewater that's been treated and normally sent out into nature, we can send that up there as well with the dilution and uh, take advantage of the RO plant at Las Virginas so we don't have to construct one ourselves, which is a nice win-win. Water has become a regional issue, not a city issue, and we're working cooperatively, and uh, city ma uh, project manager Cliff Finley is uh, spearheading that with his department to make this a win-win for everybody, and water needs to be moved around because it's become more and more scarce as time goes on. 
So I'm very excited about the opportunities. Next is stormwater capture and reuse, and that's the next one on the agenda. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Before we close the public hearing, I see Mr. Finley would like to address this issue. It was my understanding that we weren't quite there yet to partner with them, but maybe you have an update. Madam Mayor, Council, good evening. Um, the, the, the moral of this story is um, there's, uh, we have a lot of options, and what we're really looking at right now is trying to figure out what the best option is for the residents of Thousand Oaks. Uh, from a cost standpoint, uh, from a regional standpoint, et cetera, we want to make sure that whatever decision we make about with our water is, is a benefit, the most benefit uh, to the city. So, uh, Al, we're still looking at uh, the treatment plant. Kevin, we're looking at uh, cooperating with our neighbors. We're actually just looking for what's, what's best, and we don't know have the answer yet, which is why we haven't came and told council what we're going to do. But we'll, we'll continue to work at it. That's what I thought. Thank you for clarifying that. You can call okay. him the wanderer. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. If there are no further comments or questions, I will close the public hearing and then open it up for a council discussion and or motion. I'll move uh, 8A. Council Member Al Adam moves LA, I mean LA, um, 8A. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right. Council Member Adam. How do you vote? <laughs> yes. Say L. <laughs> yes. Council Member Jones. Aye. Council Member McNamee. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Angler. Yes. And Mayor Bill De La Pena. Yes. And that motion carries 5-0, and I do have an ordinance title to read into the record. That's an ordinance amending the Thousand Oaks Municipal Code, repealing in its entirety Chapter 2, Article 11, Title 10, and adding Chapter 2, Article 11 of Title 10, adopting regulations for water conservation. Thank you so much, and this is approved unanimously. We will now go to item 14, which is our city manager, Drew Powers. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Bill de la Pena. Uh, we'll be back here uh, two weeks from tonight, the 30th of November, uh, single agenda item following up on Planning Commission's uh, action last night, uh, a public hearing on uh, the Lakes residential proposal. Um, we have a couple of consent calendar items that evening uh, as well. Um, that's on the 30th. Just want to take a moment to wish everyone a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving holiday. I uh, hope uh, everyone has a chance to enjoy time with uh, the family uh, that uh, perhaps they didn't have a chance to do last year. Thank you very mu much, uh, Mr. Powers. Yes, I do hope that families will be able to gather this time around for Thanksgiving. Wishing you all a um, blessed Thanksgiving and see you on November 30th. Good night. <laughs>